So as people are uh, trickling in, um, again, this is the second panel of the Expanding Empathy Speaker Series uh, hosted through the Rock Ethics Institute. I'm your host, Daryl Cameron, Associate Professor in Psychology and Senior Research Associate in the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, this is our fifth year running this series. Um, we try to bring together researchers who do work in empathy and moral decision-making and think about areas of overlap and ways to foster interdisciplinary discussion. Uh, building on last year, um, as you may have seen in the first panel, uh, at the end of last month, building on last year, we are doing a new format where we are bringing in a psychologist and a philosopher to each give separate talks and then have a lot of space left over for uh, discussion and trying to see how we might see different disciplinary takes on uh, similar topics and themes. Um, we have two uh, wonderful scholars joining us today, uh, Dr. Patricia Lockwood and Dr. Hannah Reed. Um, let me just briefly introduce them. And I should also introduce my my co-panelist, my co-host today, Dr. Martina Orlandi in philosophy at Trent University, um, former member of the Imp Lab from last year. And uh, she is going to be co-moderating much like she did last year as well. So um, let me briefly introduce both speakers, and then we will kick it over to Dr. Lockwood to get us started. So Dr. Pat Dr. Patricia Lockwood is a Sir Henry Dale Fellow and Jacobs Foundation Research Fellow at the University of Birmingham, uh, She run where she runs the Social Decision Neuroscience Lab. Uh, she was previously a junior research fellow at Christ Church in Somerville College, University of Oxford, and a medical research council fellow at the University of Birmingham, Unity, University of Oxford, and University of Zurich. She holds a PhD in psychology from University College London and a BSc in psychology and philosophy from the University of Bristol. Um, she recently received the Leverhelm Prize in psychology. She's also received the Early Career Award in the, from the Society for Social Neuroscience, the Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science, and the Young Scientist Prize from the European Society for Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience. Um, joining Dr. Lockwood will be Dr. Hannah Reed, um, who is a philosopher who is a mixed methods researcher uh, with a focus on empathy in human, human, and human computer interactions, responsible artificial intelligence, as well as the ethics of new digital technology in light of users' experiences. Uh, she currently lives in Chicago and works at Duke University. Uh, she's published in a variety of uh, a variety of fascinating papers in a range of philosophy journals, uh, including a uh, paper on empathy and how to define it in Philosophy Compass, a paper on empathy and common ground in ethical theory and moral practice, and more recently, a paper on empath empathy and political disagreement and division in philosophical studies. So um, our two wonderful speakers for today. Um, so Patricia Lockwood will go first. Um, we'll have time for a few questions afterwards, and then um, Hannah Reed will go second. A couple, one update from the first panel. Um, make sure to use the um, Q&A function in Zoom. You should see it there at the bottom to ask your questions. Feel free to drop questions in. Um, I'll be monitoring um, as will Martina and we'll take a look. Um, one new thing this time, people will see your questions. So, um, you know, people will see your name if you ask a question and they'll be, be able to see the question as well. This is one thing we're a pivoting to for this panel and moving forward to make it more like an immersive sort of audience experience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ping me in the chat. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Lockwood. Great. So thanks so much for that lovely introduction, Daryl. I'm really looking forward to the session today. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and make sure you can all see the slides. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the question of how willing are we to put in effort to help other people. Um, so I would refer to this process as pro-social motivation, and I'm going to talk about how it might be similar or different across the lifespan, and how, how some of the uh, neural correlates of pro-social motivation might be instantiated in the brain. OK, so why am I interested in this question? So we already know that from things like climate change to infectious disease and aging populations, current and future generations face these really great challenges. And of course, there's lots of kind of technological innovations that we can use to um, alleviate their impact. But we also know that in order to change them, people are going to have to be willing to put in effort. <clears throat> 
So I think it's really important to think about some of the behavioral mechanisms for why we're willing to put in effort and why sometimes we don't want to put in effort when it helps other people. And of course, we can think of um, many kind of definitions of pro-social behavior or pro-social motivation. But here I'm going to define it as simply a pro-social decision um, is an effortful decision that helps another person. So um, that could be at a cost to yourself or it could just be done for selfish reasons. But here we're just saying that a pro-social behavior is simply an effortful decision that helps another person. And as I mentioned in this talk, I'm going to speak a little bit about kind of how we've been measuring this, um, how it might change across the lifespan. And at the end, I'm going to be talking a little bit about whether it's similar or different around the world. So one of the main approaches that people in my group have taken to understanding pro-social behaviours is this kind of computational modelling approach. And it's inspired by some of the work in visual neuroscience uh, done by David Ma, who's shown here on the left. And of course, again, there's many different approaches that we can take to study pro-social behaviour. But I think this one is really interesting because it proposes that in order to understand something, we need to understand multiple levels of explanation. So in this case, first of all, we need to understand the computation. So the kind of why someone's doing something or the goal of their behavior. So here that would be a pro-social behavior. The next thing that we need to understand is the kind of algorithm that the system uses to achieve this. And of course, again, there's many different algorithms that we could use. But here I'm going to suggest that effort discounting is a really important process. Um, so there's an equation here and it doesn't really matter um, what the different components are. But the main thing is the idea is that we calculate a kind of reward of the sort of action that we might do. But the reward that we might get is devalued by the E, by the amount of effort that we're going to have to put in to get it. So that's one kind of basic algorithm that we might use when we're deciding whether or not to be pro-social. And finally, we need to understand uh, the implementation, so the how or the physical. And again, of course, um, there's not just one brain area that is involved in pro-social behavior. There's probably lots of different brain areas. But in this framework, we can try and very precisely um, look at the differences between the brain areas involved in my own decisions that only impact me and perhaps some brain areas that are more specifically involved when I make a decision that impacts on someone else. Mm -hmm. And here I'm going to suggest that it's really this area 24, um, also known as the anterior cingulate gyrus, that might be one part of the brain that is relatively socially specified. So in this framework, I'm going to argue that we can kind of try and dissociate um, self-benefiting and pro-social behaviours, either at the algorithmic level or at the implementational level. OK, so how do we measure pro-social behaviour in this effort-based decision-making framework? Well, I suggest that we can draw on these theoretical accounts of motivation to think about how willing we are to put in effort to help others. And previous studies of pro-social behaviour have suggested that perhaps people are quite selfish. So what I'm showing here is the results of a meta-analysis in over 20,000 people on a game known as the dictator game. So this game is very simple. You're given some money and you have a really simple choice to make. You can keep all of the money for yourself or you can choose a proportion of it to give away to another person. And that person is completely anonymous. And what they find when they look at, um, sorry, what they find when they look at lots and lots of these decisions amongst many people is the po most popular option in about 36% of people is to just keep all of the money yourself. So give none of it away to this anonymous other person. Of course, again, there's some variability in behavior. We can see it exactly half maybe about 17% of people want to give the money, like half of the money away. And it's been suggested that's because we have these preferences for fairness or equality. But the general take home from these kind of economic games is maybe people are quite selfish. They don't want to be that pro-social. Other work has suggested that when we think about um, helping others in the kind of negative domain, so in the domain of harm, maybe suddenly we care more about the outcomes of other people. So what I'm showing in this graph is a study by Molly Crockett and colleagues, um, who I think was one of the speakers in the last uh, Ethics Institute seminars. 
And she found this really interesting effect that when it comes to preventing harm to other people, suddenly we seem to care more about others than we would from harming ourselves. So if we're going to profit from harming ourselves or profit from harming another person, suddenly we're, we're caring more about the other person. So that would suggest when it's a moral choice, maybe um, we're hyper altruistic. However, we know in everyday life, we're not often asked to make these kind of strange decisions. It's not like, will you give all your money away or will you stop someone experiencing electric shocks? Instead, we're making these kind of smaller decisions every day about whether we're going to put in effort to help someone. And theoretical counts of motivation suggest that we make that effort based decision by weighing up the positives or the benefits or the kind of rewards we might get against the negatives or the costs of the amount of effort we have to put in. So we might ask, am I going to hold open this door for a stranger or am I going to help out my colleague with their work? And what I think is interesting about this um, theoretical account of motivation is it also has some empirical evidence. So what we know is that there's actually single neurons in the frontal cortex. So this is recordings from a macaque monkey and they scale their firing rate with the amount of efforts, the a subjective value of how much effort you need to put in to get a reward. So this suggests there's a kind of like single neurons in the brain that are making this effort-based calculation. And when we make an effort-based choice, there's really two crucial components. So first we need to decide, am I gonna do it or am I not gonna do it? And then once we've made that decision, we need to exert the right amount of effort so it's sufficiently forceful and precise to get the right outcome. And in the first study, we wanted to use exactly this framework to ask this about pro-social behavior. So am I willing to put in effort to help another person? Um, so what we did in all of our experiments was we started with a slightly strange setup, which I'm showing here on the right. So we got two participants to come into um, our experiment, labeled as self and other, and they were there with two experimenters, so experimenter one and experimenter two. And they just kind of waved either side of a door. And we did that to make sure that they knew that their decisions would really affect another person. So we're gonna assign these people to these self and other conditions, and they're really gonna make effort-based decisions for someone else. But importantly, and um, because they're doing this on the other side of a door, all information about their age or their gender is um, kept anonymized so that they can't be influenced or reciprocal to these kind of factors. So then what we did was we got people to squeeze a grip force device um, on the exert effort thing here to measure their strength. So we could calibrate all of their choices to their own individual strength. And we then gave them a choice um, and they could choose either to rest on each trial where they wouldn't have to put in any effort, but they would only be able to get a very small reward. So one credit translated into money at the end. Or alternatively, on, sorry, alternatively on each trial, they could choose the work offer, which would always be more credits. So in this case, eight credits, but they'd also have to squeeze harder. So a higher proportion of the maximum amount of their squeezing or their MVC. And crucially, Sometimes they made these decisions where they made the choice, they put in the effort and they could get the credits. But on other trials, the participant themselves chose between the two options. They had to put in the effort, but this anonymous other person would receive the credits. So this allowed us to measure two things. So first of all, are people equally willing to put in effort to reward themselves and another person? And secondly, once they've chosen to help, do they actually energize their actions to the same degree? And what we found was that people were what we called um, less pro-social. So as the effort level went up, they were less and less likely to choose that work offer over the rest offer. But importantly, these effects were exacerbated, as you can see here, when they were making decisions for the other person. So as the effort level went up, they were less and less likely to help. We replicated these effects um, in a separate experiment, and we also tried it out when we got people to put in effort to avoid losing money for another person to see if it was a kind of valence effect, like in those harm aversion studies, and we found that it wasn't. So next, looking at how much people actually squeezed once they chose to help on the trials where they did choose to help, and we found here that people were perhaps superficially pro-social. 
They were choosing to help, but they were in fact less energized by the actions that helped another person at the higher effort levels. Again, we replicated this in a separate sample. And again, we saw the same for avoiding losing money. So the next thing we can do is we can use some of these computational models to kind of get one parameter, in this case, K. So this would be one individual number that determines how people are making these decisions. And this is really useful because when you've got an experiment with lots of different reward levels and lots of different effort levels and self and other, it's really helpful to just have one number that can kind of mathematically quantify people's decisions. And I won't go too much into the details, but the idea here is that K determines how steep your discount function is. So if you have a very low K, that means you're kind of always going to choose to do the work offer, even as the effort level goes up. But if you have a very high K, that means that very quickly, as the effort level goes up, you're going to choose not to do it. So these higher effort levels really stop you from making the behavior. And we found through all of our modeling that the best model that explained how people make these choices were that K was different whenever people were deciding for themselves or someone else. And it had this kind of shape. So as the effort level went up, people were less likely to do it. And this is really useful because now we can compare the K parameter between different populations and also look at some of the neural correlates. So the next question we wanted to ask with this task was, do we get more prosocial as we age? And if so, why? And we wondered about this because, as I showed you before, perhaps younger adults were willing to help, but as the effort level went up, they were much, much less likely to do so. But we know that maybe older adults might behave differently. So if we look at that dictator game where you just simply have to give money away to another person, it seems that older adults donate more when they're playing these economic games. There's also certain theories from uh, social psychology, such as by Laura Carstensen, that suggest that as we get older, we kind of prioritize pro-social goals. So there might be kind of theoretical reasons for thinking older adults might be <laughs> more helpful. And on the biological level, we know that there's kind of neurochemical changes that are happening in the brain. So there's evidence that as we age, levels of dopamine might uh, decline in the brain, whereas levels of things such as oxytocin, which has been linked to um, positive social behaviors, might remain stable. But one of the problems with using um, just simply economic games to measure age-related changes is we know that older adults just have more money. So is it that surprising that they give away more money in the dictator game? And secondly, it's really important that we're able to separate um, social and non-social changes with age. So we know that as people get older, perhaps their physical abilities might go down slightly and their cognitive abilities such as working memory might change. So we really need to isolate, is this a change in social behavior or is this a change in something more domain general? OK, so in our next study, um, what we did was we tested 92 younger adults. So these were adults age 18 to 36. And we tested 95 older adults, so age 55 to 84. And we tried to very carefully match them on things such as their gender and their years of education. And importantly, this was a healthy ageing sample. So we screened the older adults for dementia and made sure that everyone who took part did not have a kind of co-occurring uh, dementia. So here I'm just plotting uh, the K values from that model that I mentioned. And if you remember, if you have a higher K, that means you're less motivated and a smaller K, so closer to zero, that means you're more motivated. So here, first of all, I'm just showing the data from the younger adults. And again, we replicate those effects. So younger adults have a lower self K than an other K. So that means they're less motivated to help others than they are to help themselves. But when we looked in the older adults, although there was still an other self difference, it was greatly reduced. So older adults were actually much more pro-socially motivated compared to the younger adults. And these effects um, were clear in our analysis, which showed the strong agent by group interaction, which is just that the difference between other is larger than the difference between self and older adults are more pro-socially motivated. So we wondered, is this because older adults are just using a different model 
But when we ran our whole model comparison, so this is just comparing um, the different models to one another, we saw exactly the same model one, both for the younger and the older adults. So it's not that they're using a different model, but it's just that they seem to be more willing to put in effort to help others. So next we could look at that really nice other measure that we have that perhaps is more implicit. So how much are they actually energized by the actions? And we saw in younger adults, again, there was this over energization of action, particularly at the higher effort levels for self. But interestingly, when we looked in the older adults, this completely went away. So older adults were equally motivated to kind of exert force that would benefit both themselves and another person. And importantly as well, there were no differences in success. So to succeed at the experiment, you have to hold um, the bar over the yellow line and you get this real time feedback. But both groups were just as, just as successful in getting the reward once they'd chosen to do it. But older adults were just as energized for themselves and other. OK, so the final experiment I'm going to talk about um, in the section of pro-social motivation before just mentioning one uh, global study at the end is some of these neural correlates of self and pro-social motivation. So can we actually distinguish in the brain some of the parts that might be involved when we're making our own effort based choices or when we're making them to help another person? And if we look at um, previous imaging work that has looked at physical effort valuation, so this is just in the non-social domain, we see that there's several parts of the brain that seem to track how effortful something is trial by trial. So we can see these areas of the brain are the ones in pink here, and these include um, the more dorsal anterior cingulate cortex or dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, um, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and this insular area. So these brain areas track trial by trial, the subjective value of putting in effort when we're making choices to benefit ourselves. And when we think about what these brain areas do um, in studies of kind of social cognition, we know, for example, that this anterior insular region has come up before in studies uh, which have looked at how we respond to seeing other people in pain, but also how we respond to seeing ourselves in pain. So that suggests that these self and other representations might be quite domain general if we see them in regions like the anterior insula. But I've also done work suggesting that some other regions that we don't see on the left, so this anterior cingulate gyrus region, which is just below this pink area, might be domain specific. And by that, I mean it might respond specifically when we're doing something related to social behavior and doesn't respond to our own behavior. So here we wanted to ask whether these pro-social and self-benefiting decisions rely on these domain general mechanisms, so the pink ones we can see on the left, or there might actually be domain specific areas that are relatively specialized for social effort. So what we used here was um, a very similar experiment to the one I introduced at the beginning. So people were making choices between resting and working, and these varied in credits that they could get, but also how much effort they would have to put in. Um, and we really got them to squeeze in the scanner. So we very carefully um, looked at the experiment before so that we could kind of decorrelate these motor um, actions from choices at this point. But here we also use this kind of quite advanced analysis technique called representational similarity analysis. And that was very useful for us because what we could do was build up these little um, squares here. So I'll explain what they are. So what they do is they correlate each individual condition with each other condition. So this is just a correlation matrix and you can see down the middle, it's completely blue. This means that these things are completely correlated and the regions that are more yellow are more dissimilar. So this yellow re uh, part of the matrix here is just the difference between effort level two and effort level six. So it's yellow because that they are the most different conditions. And then we can correlate this whole matrix with parts of the brain and ask what parts of the brain represent how dissimilar effort is, how dissimilar um, value is, and how dissimilar reward is. And because we manipulate all of these things independently, we can actually look in the brain at these representations separately. So we were interested in whether there were parts of the brain that specifically signaled effort for other people, um, and also whether there were parts of the brain that signaled subjective value for self and other. <laughs> 
The next thing that we could look at is this effort required part. And we could build a um, number that just went up and down with the amount of effort people had to put in. And again, we could look for brain areas that followed that same pattern. So they also went up and down with how much effort people had to put in. And in this study, um, since we're talking about empathy, I thought I'd have to mention it. We did also measure um, these individual differences in empathy. So we asked everyone who took part in our fMRI experiment to just answer a questionnaire about how much empathy they think they experience in everyday life. And we separated these into two different aspects of empathy. So cognitive empathy, which is kind of thinking what other people think, um, and effective empathy, which would be resonating with other people's emotions. So I feel happy when you feel happy, for example. Okay, so participants completed this task um, in an fMRI scanner. They filled in this self-report assessment of empathy. And we were really interested, as I mentioned, in areas of the brain that responded to other effort and didn't respond to self-effort. So when we looked for um, that type of part of the brain, what we found was that only one area of the brain, this anterior cingulate gyrus region shown here in blue, seemed to carry this multivariate representation of effort. So you can see that it positively correlates with the other effort patterns, so here in blue, but actually doesn't respond at all differently from zero to the self-effort pattern, and it's also significantly different. So next we asked whether um, this multivariate representation of other people's effort um, correlates with self-reported empathy, and we found that it did. And what was quite surprising was it was actually those people who were highest in empathy had the strongest representation of others' effort. So this suggests that um, if you're high in empathy, you're actually more strongly representing the effort costs. We also found that this multivariate representation then predicted how much effort people would go on to put in at that other time point in the trial. So not only were people higher in empathy having a stronger representation, those who had a stronger representation also then put in more effort later on in the trial. And finally, we looked at that force period, so when people actually had to squeeze and how much effort they had to put in. And again, we find the anterior cingulate gyrus as one of the only areas that signals this pro-social motivation and not self-motivation. So that suggests that this anterior cingulate gyrus region might be really important for pro-social effort. So you might be wondering, does anything happen on self-trials? It would be really weird if it didn't. And when we do the reverse contrast, we look at areas of the brain that are more representing self-effort than other effort. We find this part of the brain here known as the ventral tegmental area. And here we can see it shows a completely different profile. So it positively correlates with um, self-subjective value, but doesn't correlate with other. And finally, what about those domain general regions that we already know are involved in self-effort? Are they involved in other effort? And we found that they were. But importantly, these dorsal ACC regions and these anterior insular regions actually just did both self and other. So they're responding in exactly the same way, both in the multivariate representation and in the trial by trial. So what we're suggesting here is that you have these distinct neural representations for self in anterior, sorry, in ventral tegmental area, but then you do find some of these common processes that track effort for self and for other. Okay, to summarize that before I present one very last study quickly, I suggest that young adults might be self-biased in their effort-based decision-making. They choose to help others left, particularly um, at high effort, and they exert less force. But older adults might somewhat lose the self-bias. They choose to help others more, even at high effort, and they exert equal force. And I've suggested that perhaps there's these distinct neural representations of pro-social effort in, in this anterior cingulate gyrus region that vary with empathy, whereas self-effort might be represented in this distinct part of the brain in the ventral tegmental area. Okay, so final study. So we wondered about whether we get more pro-social as we age, and if so, why? And I think this question is interesting, but when um, you present this, people, you know, they wonder, is this just an effect of the lab, or is this something we can see around the world? So we find that older adults are more willing to put in effort to help others, and these specific neurobiological correlates. But a key question is, are older adults more pro-social to everyone? 
So again, when you talk about this, maybe this is particularly salient in Europe, but people are like, oh, but didn't all the older adults vote for Brexit? That doesn't seem very pro-social. Um, is it really that they're being more pro-social to everyone or is it just kind of a weird lab effect? And the second question is, are older adults more pro-social everywhere? So um, as you might know, in psychology, one of the big debates is, are we just looking at weird populations? So populations who are Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic or weird. Um, and this can be a really big concern because, you know, obviously our lab based studies are somewhat limited by people who live in, in the local community. So are we actually able to see around the world whether like all people are more pro-social with age? Um, so during the pandemic, we had the opportunity to get a bit closer to this question. And this was work led by my postdoc, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joe Cutler, who's shown that on the right. So we got involved in this international collaboration on the social and moral psychology of COVID-19. And what I'm showing you on the left is um, the original paper and the sample size and geographical reach that we were able to obtain. So we were able to test 46,000 participants and this covered the whole lifespan from age 18 to 99. And this included 67 countries and territories. And the darker colors just mean that we had a larger sample um, in that area and we were each tasked for trying to get at least 500 people. So we had a few different measures um, of pro-social behavior and we can question how close they are, but this was a very big study and we just had to kind of go with what was short and available. So we measured uh, distancing in order to protect other people. That can obviously have some selfish motivations, but we try to control for many, many different things to get around that. We we're also able to look at donations in a kind of dictator game uh, setting. So we were able to look at a question where we asked people, imagine you get your median daily income and you have a simple decision to make. You can keep all the money for yourself or you can donate some of it to helping a charity uh, that is helping victims of COVID in your own country and a charity that is helping victims of COVID abroad. And we found that distancing and donations were correlated with each other, which is maybe another indication that they were measuring something generally pro-social. We also took lots of individual difference measures that we factor analyzed into a concept we called in-group preference, um, as we were interested in whether this also changed with age and explained some of these pro-social differences. And as I said, we controlled for many things. So we controlled for perceived risk of catching COVID, physical health, subjective wealth, country level wealth in the country, COVID-19 severity in the country at the time of testing. And we pre-registered um, our analysis plan before we had the data. So we hypothesized that older adults would be more pro-social based on the lab work, and therefore they would report greater distancing and greater donations. However, we also um, hypothesized that older adults would be more biased donating to the national over the international charities based on this general evidence that older adults seem to actually um, want to help people closer to themselves. And finally, we predicted that differences across age would be associated with this in-group preference factor. And for all of our analyses, we split our sample into two samples since we had so much data and then we could internally replicate all of our findings. So first of all, are older adults more likely to distance? We did found that, find that older adults reduce their social contact to protect themselves and others. And you can see that replicated both in subsample one and subsample two. So as age went up, people were more likely to report that they distanced. Importantly, we did control for perceived risk of catching COVID and their current level of health. And that the results stayed the same. OK, so do older adults report they would donate more to charity? And that's exactly what we found. Again, in both subsamples, as people got older, they were more likely to give away money um, to benefit charities in general. And this has collapsed over national and international. But are older adults more biased in who they donate to? That's exactly what we saw. So as people got older, they were more and more likely to donate more to the national charity and actually became less likely to donate to the international charity. So although they're becoming more pro-social in their donations and distancing overall, there is an effect of who 
that donation helps. So the next thing we want to do, which is plot these effects across countries um, to see whether they were globally consistent. And we found that they generally were. So in most countries, older people distanced more. So the more red this is, the more significantly positive that age and uh, distancing effect is. So older adults distance more, and that's globally relevant. Um, in most countries, older adults donate more. And this effect of age and less donations to international charities is also apparent globally. Finally, do in-group preferences kind of mediate or moderate this association? So we found that age was positively associated with in-group preferences. So as people got older, they seemed to care more about helping people they perceived as part of their in-group. And we also found that in-group preference did mediate that effect. So in-group preference accounts for why people do more distancing and more national donations, but actually less international donations. So to summarize all of that together, why and when are people pro-social or selfish? We found that older adults are more pro-social in their choice and their force, but they still distinguish between self and other. And it seems that maybe these age differences hold around the world. And secondly, we might be able to um, dissociate some of these neural correlates to a certain extent. So we found domain general coding of effort in this dorsal ACC and anterior insular regions, but perhaps some specific coding of prosocial motivation in the anterior cingulate gyrus. So I'd like to thank all the many people who uh, contributed to this work, the, the funders of this work, and of course you for your attention. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk. And uh, if anybody has questions, I do see the one question there in the chat already. Um, please go ahead and use the Q&A function. As a reminder, um, questions are visible to others. And you can, if you so desire, upvote different questions. Um, that is a new thing we're trying this time around. Um, so let me just, uh, I'll read you this first question, and then if others roll in, please, we'll uh, continue. But Judith Newman asks, you may get this, well, this was when you were presenting some of your data on older adults in the original pro-social effort task is when she asked this. Um, could the difference with older adults be a cohort issue and not an age-related issue? Yeah, so I think that's that's a really great question and, you know, one that obviously you have to be very careful about when it's um, when you're looking at these age related differences. So obviously this is cross sectional data. It's very hard to do a longitudinal study, but we did try and rule out cohort effects as much as possible. So one of the analyses that we did with the data was um, we took advantage of the fact that life expectancy can be quite different globally. And then we can um, take age adjusted by life expectancy. So you can actually decorrelate chronological age from life expectancy age, and we still see all of the same effects. So that would suggest there's something about um, the aging process rather than a cohort issue. So the second thing that um, we found quite striking that I think is not really answered by the lab study, but by the global study, again, is that when we looked at countries that showed a different pattern in the association between age and pro-social behavior. There wasn't anything in particular that seemed to um, tie them together in terms of their like religious history or um, in terms of their economic history, for example. So one of the three countries that didn't show the effect were China, the Netherlands and Spain. Um, and I was just in the Netherlands last week and they also said there was no reason they could think those three countries were particularly you know, there wasn't a kind of common theme. If we found this like big Western versus Eastern divide, for example, that could be more like cohort. But yeah, so I think those two things kind of speak against it being cohort effect. And of course, it'd be great to do a longitudinal study, but it's just very difficult across such a large lifespan. I hope that helps a bit. So while we wait for any more, we'll take a few questions at this phase before flipping into Hannah Reed's talk. Um, if any more, if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to chime in. Um, uh, Martina, Hannah, yourselves, if you have any questions. Um, you know, one question I had while we're waiting for other questions, I suppose, is 
So trying to, so thinking about the integration between the, the first two thirds of your talk and the last piece, especially with the age differences and donation across the world, I was wondering, so you're finding this effect it's within the effort choice, the effortful choice task that older adults are responding with uh, less differentiation between self and other. Um, they're acting more pro-socially on behalf of other people. And so I'm trying to think about that in the context of the uh, in-group donation effect. So the fact that although they're donating more, they're also showing more of this parochial sort of preference in their donation. And I'm just wondering if, you know, if part of the, if part of the self other effect you've documented previously is due to differential perceptions of effort, could it be, could, could that, could, what is, what do you see as the role of the potential role of effort in the parochial donation effect you're seeing in the second, that last piece of data. I'm just trying to think of the juxtaposition mm -hmm. of those findings. Yeah. So obviously with the other one, um, with the lab work, we made it very clear that the other person was anonymous um, and they didn't know anything about them, but we did ask them at the end just to rate how similar they thought the other person was, even though they didn't know anything about them. And what was interesting is that um, older adults and younger adults rated that they were significantly more similar above chance. So it was like a 10 point scale and they were significantly higher than five. Um, and also there were no differences between ages. So I think, I guess I would say that they kind of do, you know, in the, in the global one, we very clearly say this is people in your country, this is people abroad. And you see those effects, whereas I'd say in the lab-based study, it seemed that the older people assumed that the people that they were playing for were similar to them. And obviously they would know that they're kind of close by. So my my hypothesis would be that, you know, if we did an in-group, out-group manipulation on the lab-based task, you would see the same effects. And that's something that would be interesting to do. Yeah, that sounds like a fascinating study worth doing, um, definitely. Um, so we got a couple more questions that have popped in. Um, so on this theme, so Jerry, Jerry Richardson, and again, I think any of you in the audience can also should be able to see the actual questions as well. Um, thanks for the cool talk, he says. He's wondering to what extent the increased pro-social behavior observed in older adults could be attributed to greater wealth. Uh, for example, in a retired person who has plenty of money are they more, or is it that they're more willing to exert effort to help others? Is that sometimes due to time affluence? They have plenty of resources for themselves. They can now help others. So what data or explanations do you think can speak to this possibility? Yeah, so thanks so much for your question. I think, you know, these are all really tricky issues that we have when we're kind of studying age-related differences. Um, I think because of that in the effort task, in terms of this time difference, um, one of the things we do is whether you choose to work or rest for the other person, it takes exactly the same amount of time. The experiment itself is a kind of fixed length. Um, you know, within the experiment, we can manipulate these things as much as possible. So I think that that's kind of one of the reasons we came up with the task, because again, if you look at global data, there's lots of evidence that older adults do engage in more volunteering. And like you say, well, is that surprising because they have more time? Um, and whether the greater pro-social behavior could be due to greater wealth. Again, in the effort task, the cost to yourself is not financial. So on the trials where you choose to put an effort to reward someone else, you don't lose any money. Those trials where you choose for yourself and those trials when, when you choose for someone else are completely independent. Um, and that is quite different from economic games where as I said, like the cost to you is financial. So again, I agree, it's not surprising. Older adults will give more. So I think in this context, we can try and get around um, some of those issues by manipulating them in the experiment. Um, I agree, we kind of haven't solved the whole, the whole thing. I think these things could still have an impact for why we see older adults or why there's other data showing that they're more pro-social. But I think in combination with these lab-based tasks, um, it maybe makes it more convincing. And I think it is interesting about social behavior changing because people are really willing to get on board with older adults um, having declines in physical abilities or cognitive abilities. 
but people maybe don't feel like their social behavior changes. And I think it's interesting to think about why you might have that perception. Um, but yeah, I think I think it probably does. And it's nice to see something that maybe also differs in a positive way across the lifespan, something that improves or like remains stable. So just a couple comments. Um, so Judith Newman, who asked the original question, just mentioned here that famous personality theorist Eric Erickson speaks of awareness of mortality as being associated with a sense of generativity and legacy making. Um, and especially in like middle to late, in terms of his lifespan personality theory, following the middle to late adulthood. So perhaps changes in how people perceive the moral goals over the lifespan might be an interesting complement to what you were saying here. Yeah, I think I think that's really interesting. I think from my more like biological perspective, I'm interested in still why that would happen. So, you know, is it just a kind of social psychology explanation or are there these biological changes happening that kind of lead to these differences in, in personality or, you know, co-occur because it's obviously a bi-directional thing. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting to see other theories along those lines. And then I guess for me, it's like, what are the mechanisms that drive that change? Great. And so let me combine the last two questions that I see, and then we'll flip it over to Hannah Reed. Um, and then if anybody else has questions about uh, Dr. Lockwood's talk, you know, please feel free to go ahead and drop the questions in or hold on to them. We'll have a lot of space at the end to have continued questions about either talk and the intersections between. Um, one of my current RAs, Lauren O'Rourke, is asking, when discussing areas of the brain implicated in pro-social behavior, is that practicing pro so is it that practicing the behaviors strengthens those areas? So I think she's asking about the bi the, the bidirectional relationship between the the instantiation of the of those behaviors, neurally speaking, but also reinforcement and practice effects. And then Brandy McDonald is asking about older people's experiences. And so perhaps so perhaps the connective tissue here is the experience and how that changes both behavior and the neural implementation. Um Brandy is asking if older adults have more experiences with helping others and people helping them, given the hardships that aging brings, might that encourage older adults to engage in more? So this bidirectional you know, change over time through experience, I think applies to both questions. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to um, examine that more experimentally. So we know, for example, in uh, macaque monkeys and studies of like social network size that those monkeys who formed larger social networks um, had increased gray matter in the anterior cingulate gyrus. And they were able to kind of track that over time in an actual colony. And, that, and that's really cool to show that maybe these areas that I'm showing important for pro-social effort might be those same areas that can change in their kind of connectivity or size with experience. Um, obviously we need to test that experimentally, but I think it makes sense. You know, we know from lots of motor control studies that you can train things to make more like brain connections. There's a lot of brain plasticity. Um, and we know, for example, that like social isolation is as damaging to health as drinking or smoking. So I think there's a lot that we could do um, in this realm and think about how we can like support people to age healthily or increase their pro-social behaviors through experience or reinforcement or practice. Great. Well, um, I, I do see one more question. So Sean, we're going to hold your question until we come back and loop around at the discussion after uh, Hannah Reed's talk. Um, but thank you all for your questions. Please keep, if you, like I said before, if you have continued questions for this first talk, please just go ahead and drop them in or hold on to them. We will come back to them. So now um, let's pivot from talking about pro-social effort and connections to empathy to talking about uh, empathy and common ground. Great, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Daryl and all the organizers for um, putting together such an awesome series and special thanks to Patricia, Dr. Lockwood for a really cool talk. The questions have been great so far and I'm looking forward um, to talking about it more in, in just a bit. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about um, the benefits and risks of empathy and common ground. I'm a philosopher by training um, and so I'm sort of interested in some of these questions um, 
I'm interested in sort of normative questions that arise in this space. And that's kind of the angle that I'm going to be coming from, but I'm really looking forward to um, interesting discussion um, with folks from all different backgrounds. So we're divided into different groups um, along various lines. We're divided up in terms of things like race, gender, age, religious affiliation, political orientation, and so much more. And sometimes these divisions are really fraught. So it can be sometimes quite difficult for us to engage with one another across various social group divides in ways that are um, even minimally constructive, uh, let alone sort of respectful um, or, or morally praiseworthy. And a big question that I'm interested in in my work is this normative question of how should we relate across social differences? Previous proposals um, in politics in particular, so thinking in particular about sort of affectively polarized um, or otherwise polarized um, social divides, previous proposals um, in politics have emphasized the value of finding common grounds. So uh, President Biden um, in his inauguration speech uh, says that it's time to put away the harsh rhetoric, lower the temperature and listen to each other again. To make progress, we must stop treating our opponents as our enemy. We're not enemies, we are Americans. So the idea here is that we're emphasizing a kind of common identity as Americans and de-emphasizing perhaps differences that fuel or exacerbate um, polarization of the sort that makes it difficult for us to cooperate, um, et cetera. And even sort of notoriously divisive former President Trump in his State of the Union address said, Tonight, I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. So here he's explicitly mentioning this notion of common ground. This is something that's valuable. We should be trying to find it. And the importance of empathy in particular as a tool for finding common ground is something that's been taken up um, <clears throat> relatively recently by philosophers in particular so Michael Hannon, for instance, has this really great paper uh, recently on sort of empathy and finding common ground, the role of these um, processes in um, deliberative democratic life. <clears throat> Alex Madva also um, talks about the importance of adopting what he calls a common ground mindset when we're approaching outgroup members of different sorts. And he talks in particular about the role that perspective taking which um, you know, on many accounts is at least one form um, that empathy can take, um, the role that perspective taking can play in helping us find common ground. And I myself have thought a lot about the relationship between empathy and common ground, thinking about how it might be a particularly useful tool for helping us find common ground, especially um, perhaps in some of these really fraught and challenging cases um, that we're thinking about. So the big claims that I wanna sort of explore today are first, I, I wanna suggest that there are real benefits to harnessing empathy for finding common ground, but I also wanna emphasize the risks of doing so. There are real sort of moral uh, risks associated with taking this approach that I think are, are worth taking seriously. And I wanna suggest <clears throat> um, that sort of responsible empathizing and finding common ground requires carefully weighing the benefits and risks against each other on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and I'll look in particular at a couple of cases to see how this might sort of work in practice. So the plan is as follows. I'm gonna start by sort of laying the conceptual groundwork, saying a bit about what I mean by empathy and common ground and how the two might interact. I'm then gonna turn to some of these normative questions, thinking about uh, what the benefits and risks associated with empathy as a tool for finding common ground might be. And then I'm going to turn <clears throat> in this practical application section to look at two real world cases, case studies, where we see, <clears throat> excuse me, where we see people um, harnessing empathy in order to find common ground and provide a really helpful context for thinking through how different people might go about weighing the risks and benefits. And then uh, time permitting, I'm just gonna gesture towards some direction for future studies, um, implications that I think are really important for us all to be thinking 
more about as we sort of move forward um, in this in this area. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> allergies are hitting me hard. <clears throat> so for the conceptual groundwork, empathy, um, as everyone here I'm sure is very well aware, is this really notoriously thorny concept. Um, it's used, the term empathy is used to refer to so many different things in the literature. Um, it's often quite difficult to keep track. What I want to suggest here is that empathy, as I'm going to understand it, is this multidimensional response that has these different cognitive, affective, and motivational dimensions. These dimensions often co-occur, but they don't always do so, and they don't always do so to the same degree, which sort of helps explain why empathy comes in so many different forms or appears to have so many different faces. Empathy's affective dimension at its most basic, you might think of as a kind of affective resonance, sharing another person's affective experience, feeling sad when they're sad. Its cognitive dimension involves sort of understanding what the target thinks, feels, and why. This can also involve more cognitively complex processes like perspective taking, sort of imaginatively putting yourself in another person's shoes um, in various different ways. And it also is often thought to have this motivational dimension, which can, can be understood in two different and important ways. So it can be understood in, term, in terms of a person's being sort of motivationally attuned to the target, for instance, sharing their motivation to pursue a particular goal. But it can also be understood um, insofar as empathy is uh, what Daryl Cameron and colleagues and many others have sort of pointed out, it's a motivated response. So it's something that we can be more or less motivated to do. Um, and, you know, we that can be um, dependent, whether or not we're motivated can sort of be dependent on a wide range of different factors, um, which we'll talk about more in just a bit. Common ground, what do I mean by common ground? So traditionally in the philosophy of language, linguistics and developmental psychology, common ground is thought to be a sort of set of shared propositional attitudes, things like beliefs and presuppositions that speakers, um, share, speakers in a conversation share with one another. It's also thought to have um, a sort of behavioral dimension. So um, people will behave in certain ways depending on what they take the common ground to be. For example, they might use things like pronouns rather than nouns to refer to a common conversational object. They might say things like he as opposed to the candidate um, if they take it that they both know, um, you know the person that they're talking about. There's also um, a sense in which there can be something like cultural common ground. So really interesting work here by Tomasello and colleagues on um, uh, three-year-olds apparent sort of um, understanding that in um, in group strangers know who Santa Claus is. This idea that we share certain um, beliefs. Uh, there are certain things that we all know by virtue of sharing a cultural background. Um, and I don't have to know you personally um, in order to know if, if I perceive you to be my in-group in order to take it that you share that common ground with me. Common ground also, I take it, consists of various desires and motivations. So this is not necessarily, this isn't typically talked about um, in the kind of traditional context. But I think when we're thinking about common ground and empathy uh, in, in this sort of um, in this political context, in this in this context of sort of challenges that arise in moral life, common ground that consists in things uh, more sort of um, cognitively, emotionally rich things like desires and motivations is likely to be really important. Uh, also, non-propositional attitudes like affect and emotions, values that will be huge, sort of shared values. I take it that common ground also comes in degrees. So we can have more or less common ground. It can vary in terms of complexity. So the common ground can be more or less complex. We can share things like um, positive attitudes towards chocolate ice cream on the sort of low complexity end of the spectrum. But we can also share things um, like um, <clears throat> strong family values uh, desires that our children receive really ex excellent educations, maybe concerns that they're not receiving the kinds of educations that they should, beliefs about what 
um, the sort of how the school budget ought to be allocated. So it can really vary um, in terms of complexity in lots of different ways. I take it that common ground can also be opaque to us. So we can share common ground without realizing that we do on this understanding. And we can also be wrong about what the common ground consists in. So we might think that we have um, shared experiences and be really wrong or sort of overlook various aspects of those experiences that are quite different from one another that really put pressure on the idea that they are in fact relevantly similar. I'm going to return to this idea later on when thinking about a particular case. I think it's interesting because in some ways this sort of common ground is really um, fragile and sort of tentative in a lot of ways, but in others it could be, um, you know, in some cases it could provide a valuable starting point um, for more constructive interaction. So this is something I'll be curious to think more about with everybody. Okay, how do empathy and common ground sort of relate to each other? Well, I take it that empathy can help us create common ground and that can actually be a really powerful tool for doing so. So in this sort of a case, what I have in mind is two people empathizing and thereby creating common ground that just consists in the shared empathic experience. So two people might come together, um, realize that they have sort of shared concerns resonate with one another, affectively resonate with one another about those concerns and thereby create common ground um, consisting in the shared empathic experience of resonating with one another about these issues. Empathy can also help uncover common ground. Um, this might happen um, sort of most straightforwardly in cases involving more cognitively complex processes like perspective taking. So like when you um, imagine what it must be like for another person in their situation, or imagine what it might be like for you if you were in their situation, different kinds of uh, imaginative projection. The idea here is that we sort of simulate, we draw on our own um, cognitive emotional experiences and repertoire in order to imaginatively adopt other people's mental states and experiences um, and that process kind of uncovers things that we have in common with this other person, things that we have in our repertoire um, that are relevantly similar to what this other person is going through. So in that way, empathy can also sort of help uncover common ground that was there to begin with that we might not have been sort of previously aware of. Okay, <clears throat> that's the really rough and ready uh, conceptual groundwork. Happy to return to any of that later um, if it's useful. So why should we empathize and find common ground? What are the sort of benefits of doing this? There are real moral benefits I wanna suggest. So first of all, empathizing and finding common ground can go a long way towards cultivating positive relationships of different sorts. And these are morally significant in themselves. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the context of some concrete cases in just a moment. It can also help promote deeper interpersonal um, understanding and appreciation. So empathizing and finding things in common, the idea here is that insofar as it helps to blur harmful group boundaries of the sort that inhibit constructive and respectful interactions, these things might pave the way for sort of more positive relationships, um, which in turn might pave the way for sort of deeper understanding and appreciation of another person who you may have previously viewed as um, um, too other um, to, to understand or appreciate. There are real epistemic benefits as well. So learning from differences is a really important and obvious one. Again, here, the idea is that standing in a more positive relationship to someone, blurring some of the boundaries that prevent that can go a long way towards putting us in a position to learn from things um, that, that are different from us, views, practices, uh, ways of life, et cetera. And it can help ensure against fallibility. So this is something that's been sort of touted as extremely important since as early as Mill. And the idea here is that, you know, we're not always right, sort of simply put. And one of the best ways we can kind of protect against our tendency to sometimes maybe quite often be wrong is to put ourselves in a position um, to have our beliefs questioned. So to be interacting with people who have different ideas um, from the ones that we do. Empathizing and finding common ground, <clears throat> particularly with people who are quite different from us, 
you might think is therefore going to be a really important way to sort of put us in a better position, um, mitigate some of the harmful attitudes that prevent us from hearing what they have to say, uh, demonstrating a kind of basic open-mindedness and protecting against this tendency, this really natural tendency to be wrong. There are practical benefits here too that I think are really worth mentioning. So um, particularly when you're thinking about life in any sort of vaguely liberal democratic society, um, benefiting from cooperation, so being able to come together to work towards shared goals, this is really important, and also gaining from joint deliberation. So being able to come together and jointly deliberate on matters of mutual concern, it's really important that we're able to do so. Thinking back again to some of these really fraught relations across group divides of different sorts, we can see all too easily how it's, it's quite difficult um, for us to do this up. And it can be quite difficult for, depending on what the differences are, it can be quite difficult for us to even sort of be in the same room together, which really straightforwardly um, inhibits our ability to achieve these really important practical outcomes. Okay, why not do this? Why, what are the risks associated with empathizing and finding common ground? Well, first there's a sort of obvious perhaps risk of submitting yourself to emotional and physical harm. So if we're thinking about a lot of these really extreme cases, this risk feels really real, um, especially if you're thinking about cases involving individuals from groups that stand in sort of asymmetrical power relations to one another. You might really worry about, for example, um, the effort um, that it might take a member of a marginalized group to engage in order to empathize and find common ground with a member of a dominantly situated group um, and in some really scary and extreme cases, the risk that this person submits themselves to um, associated here with um, emotional and physical, even physical harm. There's also concerns you might have about creating or exacerbating intergroup hostility. So here what I have in mind are cases in which um, individuals come together across group divides against a sort of common enemy. So here you might have um, people finding common ground consisting in say shared um, uh, animosity or even hatred towards a third party. Unfortunately, history is sort of rife with examples like this. Um, it can be really terrifying to think about where this sort of uh, common ground, empathizing and finding common ground can lead to. It's a, certainly a risk we should take seriously. And then there's the risk of masking differences I think this is increasingly, um, this, this is a risk that is sort of, we're becoming increasingly aware and concerned about. So the risk here is that, I mean, empathy can be a really powerful tool for not just sort of finding common ground, but experiencing it. And depending on what the common ground is, that has um, the potential to mask differences that are nonetheless really important. Again, you might think of differences associated with um, in, differences in groups that stand in asymmetrical power relations to, to one another. So for example, you might think of sort of coalition building across racial divides. Um, if that means overemphasizing a common identity at the expense of appreciating very important differences between this new group, uh, members of this new um, group, that could be really problematic it can lead to decreased motivation to pursue social change. So there's a whole bunch of really interesting work in this area. Happy to talk more about it uh, later if there's interest, but um, there's a lot of um, evidence to suggest that, again, particularly when we have individuals coming together from groups that stand in asymmetrical power relations to one another, um, overemphasizing a common identity can lead to decreased motivation to pursue social change, particularly on the part of the marginalized group members. So the idea here is that if you're overemphasizing with the dominantly situated group, you might um, be sort of lulled into thinking that things are better than they actually are and thereby um, experience decreased motivation to fix things that are really pressing. There's also the risk of sort of increased indecision and antipathy. So. Um, this is maybe perhaps a little bit um, 
well, I shouldn't say that. It's concerning. Uh, I won't sort of rate the level of concern here. <laughs> but you might think that being exposed to lots of different views, masking differences um, between individuals, all this can lead to sort of confusion. You might not be sure anymore about what the sort of right thing to do is. You might feel less kind of motive, clear and motivated to pursue particular sorts of actions um, in response to a given problem. Um, and depending on what the problem is and how pressing it is, this could be this could be serious. So those are those are some of the risks. Thinking about these benefits and risks, I think draws our attention to some additional considerations. So it, it might be helpful to qualify our discussion of finding common ground in the following way. We, we might want to talk about not just how important it is to find common ground or like why it's good for us to come together and find common ground, but we might want to talk about finding different sensitive common ground. Perhaps we can find a sort of catchier title. But the idea here is that what we want to be finding perhaps is common ground that is um, that is nonetheless sort of sensitive to various differences. You might think of this as a kind of uh, for example, emphasizing um, shared identity as Americans uh, who sort of value multiculturalism or something like that. And you could think about different ways um, to, to, to do this, depending on the case. Context sensitivity. So um, whether or to what extent empathizing and finding common ground is going to be the right approach, weighing these risks and benefits is going to be a highly context sensitive matter. You might think that there's going to be room for reasonable disagreement. So thinking about how exactly to weigh the benefits and risks, um, there might be um, real and reasonable disagreement between individuals, depending on the case. And this last piece is what I'm especially interested in. I'll just gesture um, towards it again at the end um, and thinking about some directions for future studies. But training empathy and empathic capabilities, I think, is really crucial, and thinking about ways to train empathic capabilities such that we can sort of mitigate some of the risks while equipping um, ourselves to reap the benefits of this approach. So to know sort of when, whether, and how to take this approach um, is going to be really important. Okay, on to the cases. So the first case I want to briefly mention is this case of Daryl Davis. For those of you who haven't heard of him, he is a Black blues musician who's traveled um, the, across the country um, meeting with, seeking out and meeting with members of the KKK. And um, initially, this all sort of began in an effort to understand um, how it is that you can, um, he said, hate me without even knowing me. And what's happened uh, over the course of his um, career doing this is um, as a result of meeting with him and forging positive relationships, uh, many, 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 I, I'm not sure what the exact number is, uh, members of the Klan have sort of publicly renounced the Klan, um, left, and um, and continue to sustain positive relationships with Davis. He has a whole closet full of robes. Um, of people who have quit the Klan because of um, meeting and interacting with him. He talks about the importance of resonating, identifying commonalities and really resonating with these individuals about those commonalities. One of the sort of um, most well-known case stories that he mentions has to do with discussions he had initially with a Klansman about um, the blues. So a shared love of the blues and how that sort of paved the way for other kinds of more difficult conversations about race um, and equity and that sort of thing, uh, social injustice, uh, ultimately culminating with this individual leaving the Klan uh, really publicly, renouncing, renouncing ties and even working with Davis to promote, um, to help sort of promote this activity, help reach out to many um, white supremacists in an effort to correct false beliefs, et cetera. So you might think that there are sort of reasons for and against taking an approach like Davis takes. On the one hand, you might think he's really good at this. 
this is a valuable thing, right? We want less people walking around with hateful views. He's really, he's really effective. Um, here's a positive reason for empathizing and finding common ground in the way that he does. You might at the same time worry. So he's come under a lot of fire, particularly from members of the Black Lives Matter movement for uh, essentially wasting energy or misusing energy and effort um, reaching out to these ex members of the, it's like extremely um, hateful white supremacist groups, rather than um, perhaps using the energy more effectively to directly assist members of the Black community. So the idea here is that you're going through a lot of trouble. What's the sort of um, risk reward, effort reward calculation that's happening here? Are you really getting um, enough reward given the effort that you're putting in? Wouldn't you be better off I'm expending your effort elsewhere. You might think that um, here we have sort of two really reasonable considerations um, to be um, to be uh, sort of taking seriously. Uh, here we have a case, I think, of reasonable disagreement where there's going to be room for a lot of um, discussion and debate. The second case I'm going to mention is the case of C.P. Ellis and Ann Atwater. This is a case from Durham, North Carolina that's really near and dear to me, introduced to me first by my advisor, David Wong. It's an incredibly rich case. I'm not gonna be able to do it nearly enough justice um, here today. I encourage anyone who's interested to, um, to look into it further. It's so fascinating, incredibly rich, and there's actually quite, amount, quite a large amount of material um, written on this case, interviews and the like. And uh, so for those of you who are interested, I really encourage um, looking further. Um, Anne Atwater was a really prominent member of the um, Black civil rights community in Durham. C.P. Ellis was, a, was the head, actually, of the KKK in Durham. They both had children in the Durham public schools during desegregation. As you can imagine, they were extremely vehemently opposed to one another. They, um, there, there's a, a Ann Atwater recounts a time during which she was um, sort of listening to a really public racist tirade um, on the part of C.P. Ellis um, at a town hall meeting and recalls like almost stabbing him, attacking him. She I mean, it's really, it was impossible for the two of them to um, be, virtually impossible to be in the same room together. And against all odds, they were elected to co-chair a committee, a charrette 10 day committee to help uh, mitigate some of the challenges that were arising as a result of desegregating, mandated desegregation of the Durham public schools in which they both had children, they managed to come together. They were actually really effective collaborators. They forged a lasting friendship um, until Ellis died in 2005 and continued to work together um, un until his death on, um, on, racial, um, on racial issues in Durham and beyond. They both cite as sort of key mechanisms for helping them achieve this, they both cite um, empathy and common ground. So they both talk about the ways in which the, those sort of key moments in their in relationship where they identified, in this case, really complex common ground, um, uh, common ground consisting in shared values having to do with their children's education, concerns about the escalating violence in the public schools due to desegregation, uh, experiences of growing up in extreme poverty, um, experiences of social exclusion. Again, here though, I think this idea about you know whether to what extent those experiences are similar due to the real, really important racial differences between the two is worth thinking more about. But they cite these um, these experiences of identifying common ground, resonating about what's shared um, as really pivotal, really pivotal turning points in their relationship that. Um, that made it possible for them to work together in, in the ways that they did. Here too, though, I think, you know, you might have reasonable disagreement. So on the one hand, um, you might think um, a really strong positive reason for doing what they did, for putting in the difficult cognitive emotional work to do what they did, 
a strong reason is uh, this ability to respond to a really pressing problem of personal concern, but also um, but not just sort of, you might think um, the, the problem of mandated desegregation was huge at the time. De facto segregation in schools continues to be a big problem today. Um, and so their ability to work together to address these issues, um, this is a huge uh, positive outcome. At the same time, you might worry, particularly for um, Anne Atwater, this risk of submitting herself to significant cognitive, emotional, and perhaps even physical harm um, is, is something you might be really worried about, something you might not want to overlook. You might not feel comfortable sort of recommending this behavior on any, on any sort of large scale. I mean, maybe this is something that's really praiseworthy and admirable, but it's not the sort of thing we should all be trying to emulate. Um, straightforwardly, I mean, Ellis is a member of an extremely um, powerful at the time and dangerous hate group. She is a member of a group that this that this hate group targets specifically. She's putting herself at real risk here, even just um, the cognitive emotional effort involved in uh, sort of down regulating negative emotions in order to cooperate with a person like this. That's significant in and of itself. So here again, you, you know, you might see how these sort of reasons for and against come into play. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna now turn to sort of thinking about all of these considerations um, moving forward, things I'm currently working on and looking forward to thinking more about. So there are real world challenges associated um, with empathizing and finding common ground above and beyond just the sort of difficulty of weighing the benefits and risks. So um, philosopher Du Bois uh, talks about this notion fairly early on of what he calls second sight. The idea here is that members, he's thinking of members of the Black community in particular, but I think these issues apply um, to members of marginalized groups more generally. But the idea here is that members of the Black community um, for Du Bois have to develop this sort of second sight, this ability to adopt the dominant perspective which shapes and constrains life as everyone knows it. So they have to develop this ability to adopt the dominant perspective as a matter of survival, as a matter of figuring out how to navigate a world that isn't made for them or shaped by them, but rather made for and shaped by other people. We have this notion, a sort of related notion of cultural code switching. So this idea that <clears throat> individuals particularly um, in this context, thinking about um, bilingual individuals, um, how they might, it might be incumbent upon them to develop an ability, um, an increased ability to sort of switch between different cultural contexts with relative ease. Um, so uh, particularly when there's a sort of dominant linguistic culture and um, more marginalized linguistic cultures, um, individuals who sort of straddle um, the line between the two, it's sort of incumbent upon them to develop perspective taking and empathic capabilities that facilitate hopping between the two as needed, again, to navigate a world that's sort of shaped by and constrained by a dominant cultural linguistic perspective. We have then also this interesting um, emerging work on power and empathy. Um, so thinking about the effect of social power on empathic capabilities. How does occupying a position of social power perhaps inhibit um, or, or demotivate empathy for some individuals? Um, and most recently, so here is a particular um, particular example uh, looking at racial differences in women's, they call it role taking, it's essentially perspective taking with a sort of emotional component. But the idea here is that members of marginalized groups, again, sort of the hypothesis, they find that there, there are differences such that um, in this case, I think it's black and white women in particular that they're looking at uh, and white women demonstrated sort of inferior role-taking capabilities as compared with um, black women in this context. The hypothesis here and in other um, cases involving various different sorts of um, positions of social power, the hypothesis is that um, it's there's just less prudential need for individuals who occupy relative positions of social power, less prudential need to practice the skills associated with empathizing, um, such that 
Uh, but the, the same is not true for members of marginalized groups for whom it's really incumbent to sort of practice these skills um, as a matter of survival, as a means of navigating a shared world um, that's so shaped by, by, a dominant, uh, by a dominant group perspective. So I mention all this as a way of um, mentioning a, a real challenge to efforts in training empathy. So um, one of the big implications here is if we think that uh, empathizing and finding common ground, you know, it has these benefits, there are also risks. Presumably, we'd like to equip ourselves and others with the sort of skills needed to empathize responsibly and find common ground responsibly. Um, given some of these real world constraints and issues, one thing I think it sort of all this calls us to do is really re-examine uh, important social practices and institutions that shape empathy and empathic capabilities. So schools in particular, I think, are one really important place to think about. Um, <clears throat> schools are potentially a great place to institute empathy training programs of different sorts, training that, that could equip people to help mitigate the risks while realizing the benefits um, of empathy across various group divides. But schools are sort of notoriously um, they're not diverse, particularly in the U.S., but it, but not just that they sort of lack the relevant diversity, particularly along racial and socioeconomic lines, such that you might think uh, widely instituting empathy training programs in the form of, say, um, cooperative learning and teaching models. I'm happy to talk more about that if there's interest later, too. Um, just implementing empathy training in this sort of a context doesn't obviously get us closer to the goal of having individuals who are really well equipped to empathize responsibly across different group divides. After all, they're just sort of practicing empathy for people who are like them in a lot of, a lot of relevant senses. So there may be really important, a really important need to rethink um, what these institutions look like. I mean, these are big sort of uh, public policy questions, thinking about how we um, create greater diversity in schools. There may also be less, um, uh, there may be less taxing ways to, um, or sort of effortful um, ways of approaching the issue as well, um, that I, some of which I've explored in previous work, and I'm looking forward to continuing to explore later. Again, happy to talk more about some of those strategies um, later. I also think it's going to be really important for us to start thinking hard about new technologies, the way that these new technologies sort of mediate our relationships to one another um, and impact our um, uh, upskilling or de-skilling when it comes to things like empathy um, and our ability to relate constructively across different group divides. So we are um, increasingly relying on new technologies, for instance, things like virtual personal assistants like Siri and Alexa. We're relying on these technologies to perform um, various tasks, particularly in caregiving relationships of the sort um, that are usually the context for our practicing um, skills like empathy. So for example, there's this new feature of Alexa, Alexa Together, um, that is designed to help us offload caregiving tasks um, that we to, to, uh, typically perform for elderly relatives. These can be things like issuing reminders, checking in. And the idea here is that Alexa will do a lot of that heavy lifting and then sort of ping you if things are um, sufficiently bad such that um, human intervention is required. There are also um, social emotional learning robots like Moxie designed for children, designed to facilitate children's development of, of skills like empathy and connection to others. Increasingly, we're seeing things like care bots for use um, in elder care and various other hospital healthcare contexts. And we're also seeing um, a sort of surge in um, sexualized robots and chatbots for use in intimate um, intimate relationships. Again, these are all contexts in which contexts in which we traditionally practice empathy, um, perhaps not even sort of um, very cognizantly. These are contexts where we rely on our ability to understand what others are thinking and feeling, 
uh, share their feelings and concerns in order to administer to their needs. Um, the worry here is that <clears throat> um, the increasingly ubiquitous reliance on new technologies in, in across these different domains, uh, worry, the worry is um, this could have a negative effect on our ability to develop and practice these skills. So what happens when we offload many of these tasks onto artificial agents? Uh, what happens to our ability to perform those tasks, to develop the skills required for performing them? Um, similarly, what happens when we um, engage in relationships with artificial agents um, for whom there's sort of no need to um, exercise or practice these skills? So thinking in particular about um, engaging with artificial agents in a sort of intimate romantic partnership, um, you might think in that case, and unlike a case involving sort of human to human interactions, there's little need to practice and develop skills like empathy or sensitivity to differences um, uh, in the way that there is in a human relationship. What's the effect of all this on our ability to empathize with other humans? So um, that's what I have for today. I appreciate very much your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you. This was really, really extremely fascinating and very timely talk. Um, so we have, I think, already three questions, but if I can just dictatorially jump in with the first question. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Hannah, very quickly, if you think we have a moral obligation to empathize with others and find common ground, or if you think this is supererogatory. I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, it seems like polarization is increasing. And I'm, the last thing that I'm thinking about is like reproductive rights. So you might think on the one hand that we have a moral obligation to find common ground and the risk of not doing that is creating segments of the population that don't talk to each other. But on the other hand, I'm wondering if we do have a moral obligation to do so, what is the relevant condition that supports this moral obligation? Is it a pre-existing relationship? You might think we might have this moral obligation with friends and I'm thinking about I don't know, Jessica Isoro's work on having bad people as friends where she argues something similar. But what are your thoughts on this? That's a great question, Martina. I really appreciate it. I feel like in some ways that's the question. <laughs> um, I Yeah, I don't have an easy answer. I think that um, sort of whether or not we have a moral obligation and, and the sort of degree of strength of that obligation is likely going to depend a great deal on the case and on individual factors or so individual values, capabilities, um, historical context, there's going to be a whole range of different considerations that are going to be really important for deciding whether or not in this case, an individual has some moral obligation that's sufficiently weighty such that they need to act on it. I do think, though, that um, there could be a really strong moral obligation for social institutions um, of the relevant sorts to weigh in here. I think that um, big tech companies, for example, have a really strong moral obligation to think hard about the effects of um, some of these emerging technologies on users' capabilities. Obviously, there's um, sort of little prudential need for them to do that. And so thinking about how to develop policy in ways that nudges corporations to consider some of these effects is a really big and important question. I think any public institution like schools or local governments, places where we have the opportunity to help equip people with empathic capabilities that are going to be sort of more useful uh, for helping people mitigate risks um, and that sort of thing. Those sorts of social institutions, I think, have a really strong moral obligation to um, implement changes that are going to help achieve those outcomes. I think a lot of times with some of these big bureaucratic issues, um, it can be really challenging to get those changes off the ground. But um, again, as I suggested before, I think there might be relatively um, simple ways to begin to affect some change in that area. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to like mandate uh, segregation, which has been really problematic in the past. There could be 
less dramatic ways of um, beginning to make some changes, perhaps even introducing like some nudging um, practices, which are, can be that, you know, they raise moral issues of their own. Um, but I, I think there's defense, a, a defense to be made there too, um, for the use of some of those. I, I hope that addresses your question somewhat. I think it's such a big one. It does. It made me think about some of the, um, so it's, I think some public health agencies were trying to do something similar yeah. during the pandemic to sort of find <clears throat> common ground with people that were somewhat resistant to endorse vaccines. So I think, yeah. but that seems the moral obligation there. It's interesting what you say, because it seems like it's constitutive of a public health agency, say, to sort of mm-hmm. reach out in a way that may not be the case for individuals, especially mm-hmm when we are interacting with strangers. Mm. Thank you. It's a great so, example. There are a few questions for Patricia, I think. Well, maybe we can start with the questions for Hannah and then sort of circle back after. So there's a question from Jack Odiorn about training, training for empathy. Um, what age do you think this training can be more beneficial? So. The youth are educated in schools about values such as friendship or respect. And it's interesting that while these young brains are still developing, maybe instilling something like empathy in them as a young age will be important. But on the other hand, um, also curious if there becomes a certain age at which the brain is fully developed, making it more difficult to somewhat build on qualities like empathy. Yeah, that's such a really interesting question. I'm not nearly enough of an expert on brain plasticity and uh, de- developmental neuroscience to address it um, as best as I'd like to. Perhaps Patricia has some thoughts about this, but I, I suspect that there are going to be likely certain ages at which, uh, really important ages at which interventions are going to be really effective. It does look, however, like... Um, there are effective inter- event- interventions that have been effective, at least um, to some degree, um, at, at all sorts of ages. So with very young children and also with adults, I think thinking about the adult population is really interesting to me um, because, I mean, in some sense, obviously children are the future and we want to be thinking about how to equip them with these skills at the right time, um, such that they're they're going to be well poised to handle these issues in ways that are better than we are. But at the same time, there feels um, like there's something so pressing and immediate about um, making sure that um, adults uh, adults and, and people who you know, um, are sort of currently dealing with these issues and in positions of power in particular, that they're really well equipped to be handling things um, well. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, despite the fact that in some ways there are challenges associated with teaching old dogs new tricks, there do seem to be some effective interventions, um, even for us old dogs, and that there might be ways to sort of widely implement them. Um, I hope that somewhat answers your question. It's a good one. Yeah, they're all good ones. Okay, so another question is from Matt Stichter. I hope I pronounced that correctly, <clears throat> about the relevance of potential objections, in particular, whether is there psychological evidence that shows that empathy leads to masking differences, lessening social change and increasing indecision? And if so, are there ways to train empathy to avoid the side effects? Thanks so much, Matt. I'm so glad to know you're here. Um, Yes. So there's really cool work by um, John DeVidio and colleagues that I'm thinking about in particular here. I'm happy to share um, some of the papers that I have in mind. Um, But yes, so thinking, so they're not necessarily thinking about empathy as a tool for finding common ground in particular, but rather just sort of emphasizing um, common group identities um, at the expense of sort of subgroup uh, identities. Um, And what they find is exactly that, that sort of overemphasizing um, a subordinate, um, a superordinate group identity can have really negative effects with respect to motivation to pursue social change, particularly for marginalized group members. If they already observe that lack of motivation on the part of dominantly situated individuals to begin with, so that doesn't change much, but it does for the marginalized group members. 
Um, but that's not the case they find when a common group identity is emphasized that also retains some awareness um, or sensitivity to important subgroup differences. So what that looks like can again look really different depending on the context. But there's one study I think in particular where they're thinking about um, you know, sort of shared group identity as Americans. And I think the subgroup identities are like racial differences um, or various other sort of um, um, subgroup differences within that larger umbrella. So where, where the two can kind of be held simultaneously in mind, that looks like it's successful. That's a successful strategy for finding common ground um, and thereby realizing some of the benefits of doing so without um, leading to these really negative outcomes. So I think a lot of that work uh, really indicates the need for finding something like this kind of different sensitive common ground. I'm really taking my cue, my cue from that work there. That's interesting. So it doesn't seem like there's a blanket answer to should we empathize? Should we find common ground? It really depends on a case to case basis and whether the risks out outweigh the benefits. I know that's unsatisfying. <laughs> I think it's unsatisfying for us philosophers because we really want like the yeah. answer, the general theory. But, you know, as my advisor used to say, sometimes life is complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's one question from Brandy McDonald about whether the two case studies that you mentioned extend beyond the people involved in particular Brandy says, I'm concerned that this common ground that was reached between the two parties are only bridged uh, between the two parties and not extended beyond into the group that each member belongs to. So it's important that you can find common ground with a person and this may extend yeah. to a common group, uh, but the common ground established may only remain an encouragement for that individual and not for the group. So what do you yeah. think closes this gap between common ground and empathy and what else is needed? Yeah, that's another really, really great and important question. And it's not um, totally clear. So in though, so I can't actually speak to the Daryl Davis case because the number of individuals that we're talking about him interacting with is so great. There's just not enough information um, or data about sort of what's happening with them. But in the uh, Ellis Atwater case, at least in that case, it does look like um, some of the positive benefits of empathizing and finding common ground with the particular individual did extend for them to members of the other groups. But <laughs> that being said, you know, whether or not that case is an outlier, how often does this happen elsewhere? That's a huge question. There's some really interesting work um, on, and, and it's not super satisfactorily answered, I should say that. It's difficult to get the kind of longitudinal studies going that would really help you determine sort of clearly whether or to what extent some of these effects um, are, are achieved, like in the short term for just particular individuals, or do they sort of on an ongoing basis, because we want this presumably, we want these effects to sort of be lasting. Um, and to what extent do they, um, do they um, are they realized for sufficiently long periods of time? Again, and like you say, sort of for members of the group in general. There's some interesting work um, on, cooperative learning and teaching models like the jigsaw classroom, which I've been really fascinated by, um, that do find um, there's a bit of support for the idea that um, students who participate in jigsaw classrooms and um, practice and develop empathy in that context, uh, where they're sort of empathizing with members of other groups and practicing those skills um, with other group members, there is some evidence to suggest that um, that can be an effective tool for increasing empathy for members of the group more generally. So not just the particular individuals that they're practicing empathy with. It should be noted in that context though, one key feature of the model involves, um, so you have students working together in these diverse groups and that happens for a period of time. And then they switch to another diverse group so diverse along relevantly similar lines, but they're other individuals. So in that case, they're not just interacting with like one member of the other group, but they're interacting with maybe multiple members of that other group and having similarly positive experiences, uh, collaborating, working together, practicing empathy, et cetera. So 
In that case, it could be kind of the iterative process of I'm doing this once and again and again and again that facilitates um, that facilitates sort of sustaining the those results across time and then for for the group in general, not just the individual. I think it's a really great question. And if others have additional thoughts on that, I'd be curious to hear that myself. Okay, Brandy follows up, apologizes. Maybe there's a qualitative component needed to what kind of relationship is between the two parties. <laughs> okay. So Thanks, Brandy. Suggestion. Yeah, so just to, just to jump in too, I mean, this is fascinating. I do wanna leave some time too for the two of you to chat with each other as well. Um, I think one thing that, you know, some of the, with so much discussion about empathy and polarization, I think one you, you nicely foreshadowed many of the concerns that come up, you know, like whether empathy in this space, what is our responsibility to cultivate empathy, especially if the, the side we're empathizing with, you know, has values or beliefs that might work in opposition to one's very existence, um, you know, the, the, the responsibility there and whether empathy or something like outrage or anger or more appropriate things to morally like reason mm -hmm. one's way to, I think is a really fascinating one. Um, one question I had quickly, and then I want to, and I separately offline, we could talk for hours about empathy and artificial agents. I think there's plenty of fascinating stuff there too. Um, just about empathy as a source of understanding and just the boundary conditions in that effect. Um, I was actually just at a wonderful conference about mm -hmm. intergroup emotions. And it was one of the questions that came up was about this, the, the idea that people are often engaging in misperceptions about partisan mm -hmm. opponents. Mm -hmm. And it was the relationship between empathy and empathetic understanding and getting it right. Um, so, I mean, empathy is one thing you mentioned empathy as a motivation, something to cultivate a caring stance. But if people have pre-existing stereotypes or inaccuracies in their judgments about political opponents, what do you think about the possibility of, you know, false common ground where yeah. you think you understand, but you don't actually understand? Um, separately, even separate from the harm piece, the risk of harm, the possibility of epistemic mistakes. Yeah, th thanks so much. I think that is a huge concern. What's really interesting is I think something like that looks like it happened in the Ann Atwater C.P. Ellis case, at least initially, I think there's a really strong case to be made for the idea that the two of them sort of established incorrect common ground to begin with. So they did identify um, experiences that they both had that felt to them to be really similar. Again, experiences of growing up in really extreme poverty um, and, and feelings of social exclusion that were really important to them. But there were just such important differences between those two ex experiences, as you can imagine, just thinking about like the racial dynamics of the time, uh, that there's a sense in which, you know, thinking, falsely believing that these are really like, oh yes, we've been through the same thing. Um, especially you might worry about C.P. Ellis. Um, that's epistemically irresponsible. And just thinking then about the kind of common ground that that creates, that's incredibly fragile. Um, to say the um, okay, I think her connection may have cut off. I guess quickly, um, maybe if if so we have these couple of questions for Patricia, we could flip to that and then take the last mm -hmm. five or ten minutes to kind of converse like all of us and kind of get a sense for points of overlap and connection. Um, let me just quickly uh, distill these two, and then uh, we'll see if uh, Hannah comes back to us. Um, so Sean Laurent, my colleague here, asks about you know, flipping the age the age prosociality question. So going back to the idea that older people are more generous, could it be that something is inhibiting generosity for younger adults? Yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting to think of why we see um, this kind of, I mean, we've referred to it as a self bias in younger adults. If we kind of um, strip down what might be different there, in other studies as well, we've looked at um, like how people learn by trial and error, what will benefit themselves and what will benefit someone else. And again, we see that younger adults seem to have this kind of over accuracy at, at learning for self. So I do think it's something about, um, yeah, like in the younger adults, they're kind of prioritizing the self a bit more and that might operate at quite a basic level. We've also done like studies on ownership and it seems at least in younger adults, we haven't tested in older adults that they're 
quicker to say they own objects that they um, are kind of completely random and abstract if you just say is this yours or friends or a strangers they're much better they're more accurate and they're faster at learning what belongs to them um, so I think in young adults it seems to be the self over prioritization and in older adults in most of our studies you see that they're either like equal for self and other or they're a bit more kind of other oriented um, so I think that's that's part of the explanation for why we see those effects. Great. And then one more question from your presentation, and I have a question for you too, because this is fascinating work to think about, especially the empathy connections to the pro-social effort task. Uh, from Maria Teresa Alvarez Mateos, she thanks for your, your presentation. She was considering consideration of donations of charity to charity as an indicator of pro-social behavior. And it's about motivations. So do you know the donations may not always follow reasons of prosociality. And uh, moreover, the interest of social justice may prefer other solutions for economical redistribution, such as taxes, public health, public education, public social services. And so I think both like it sounds like she's asking about both the motivations behind it, but also potentially alternative operationalizations of helping. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And this is why we tend to avoid using charity donation as much as possible um, in our studies, because I I agree it's kind of confounded on the self-other conflict. If the cost to you is financial, but as you say, there might be kind of other reasons um, for seeing charity donation as a pro-social behavior. Um, in some of our other global studies that we've just been doing now, we have these kind of like several measures related to financial effects. And we also have measures of um, volunteering, helping a stranger or donating to charity. So like behavior you've done in the past month and something that we see um, for some of our effects, for example, if you look at how pro-social behaviors relate to wealth, then you do find that unsurprisingly, those effects are strongest for financial measures. But you still see associations between greater wealth and greater pro-social behavior even for non-financial measures, they're just a bit weaker. So I think these are good measures, but I think, um, and we'll see correlations are similar, but I think they're just going to be stronger and more influenced by financial gain. Great. Thanks. Oh, so um, excellent, excellent questions all. Um, I do want to make sure we save a few times for uh, a few minutes for um, talking to each other. And so if there's ways we see like the the interactions between these two talks you know on the one hand people's propensities to choose effortful pro sociality for for others um you know framed with this question of whether you know broadly speaking pro social emotions I mean I know that the pro social choice task wasn't empathy itself but pro social the, the suite of pro social capacities thinking about how to use and deploy those in social life and so I, I'm trying to think of ways to connect, you know, the, the broader question of all these moral arguments about, you know, the benefits and risks. I mean, I guess some of them are arguments based upon what we find in social science studies, but then layering on these normative questions about what is appropriate to ask of someone. I don't know. I mean, I'm curious if you, either of you have thoughts or questions for each other. Um, I mean, I think how we morally value effort is maybe a really interesting piece here. You know, whether we think our, which I should add, this this question by Shoko Watabane and the is about, you know, moral values and effort. Um, if we if we engage in pro-social emotion or pro-social effort for an antagonistic outgroup, is that seen as a betrayal of the in-groups you belong to? And does that like how might that filter into not only decisions to engage in pro-social effort, but also how we morally argue for it or for and against? So maybe, how about this? Maybe I'll like that question kind of pitch to both of you, like seeing uh, what do you think about the role of value and how we decide whether to engage in effort. And then if, and then if from there, if, you know, you have questions for each other, we could take the last five or 10 minutes to let that unfold. I think this is really interesting. I was actually thinking about Patricia's work and thinking a lot about um, differences across the lifespan and differences particularly with older adults and wondering, I'm, I'm sort of curious what you think about this question in that context, sort of what's going on 
maybe from a values perspective, maybe not, maybe it's something else, with older adults who are choosing um, to kind of um, focus their altruistic efforts in certain ways um, as opposed to others. Yeah, I'd be sort of curious to hear your take on this. I think the age piece is really interesting in particular here. Yeah, I was thinking, because I guess this increase in in in-group bias is basically saying that they have this common ground problem that increases as you get older. And I guess I thought your talk was really insightful thinking about what it means to have common ground and how that can be like leveraged for like positive change. And I guess what my research is suggesting is that older people just don't see that as readily, like that capacity to flexibly see that lots of people could be like you kind of goes away and you are more biased in in who you help so yeah I was interested in whether um we could think about you know whether you need sort of different interventions so there was that question about like can we make kids more empathic but actually if kids are already quite empathic is it like older people that we actually need to make more empathic and pro-social so that you can kind of harness this, they're more pro-social, but they don't want to help everyone. Um, and we do see that with like voting in lots of different ways. And it it doesn't just seem to be like, I mean, I know that as people get older, they become more right wing and there's quite a lot of research supporting that. But in parallel, if you like strip out the polarization, they're getting more pro-social. So maybe there, there's a way to kind of build on that. I'd be so curious too to think about what are the sort of factors contributing, uh, like experiences or other factors that contribute to that sort of change over time. And I mean, maybe thinking about whatever sort of empathy interventions are going to be useful is likely going to have to involve also thinking about ways to intervene on those other factors and what's probably going to be a really complicated multi pronged approach. But that's but that would be sort of fascinating to think more about. Yeah, so like one thing I think we see in our research is with these same older adults is that they become less good at theory of mind. So thinking about whether it's like this this um, ability to kind of flexibly take on other people's perspectives that's driving a lack of being pro-social to everyone, I think I think that could be part of the puzzle. Um, I thought it was interesting how you yeah, had empathy in those three different components. And I do think the like motivational part of empathy is really interesting. And we've looked a little bit at how different aspects of empathy map onto different aspects of motivation. And it did seem different for cognitive and affective empathy, how much they were related to how motivated you are. So I think that could also be a really interesting thing to explore more. Yeah, one of the one of the pieces from your talk, Patricia, that I thought was really fascinating, the other the correlation between affective empathy and the effort representation on behalf of others. And I was trying to think of um just more generally, um is taking that to indicate either whether people who are more trade empathetic are, you know, willing to exert the effort and or changing in how they think about the effort. So like, is it, is it that, I guess on the one hand, you might think that people who are high in trade empathy might find empathy easier in some respect or find pro-sociality easier in some respects, but if they're actually like cognitive, they're doing more of the effortful thing, but also representing it and coding it, it almost seems like one way of interpreting that might be is that they recognize the effort, but they change it, how they, inter- they, the meaning of it changes for them potentially, or maybe they value it more readily or something up. I'm just curious if you could say more about what you think the effort empathy link speaks to. Yeah, I mean, I think like like your work has suggested as well and some of Hannah's work that it's really this motivational aspect of empathy that's important. And I think I've always seen empathy and pro-social behaviors related, but definitely different. So like some definitions already um, conceptualize pro-social behavior as part of empathy and I think they can definitely be dissociated in in some cases but I do think as we've seen those people are generally more motivated are generally more empathic so as as you say like maybe 
maybe we should be thinking about the link as those who represent the effort costs more strongly will be more empathic and whether that's I mean it you know I don't want to reverse inference or anything but whether that they have a more realistic representation of what the pro-social behavior will involve or you know I, I guess the point was as you say the correlation could have been the other way around could have been those higher in empathy had a less distinct representation of pro-social effort so yeah I think that's something to build on like the association between motivation and empathy what what do you think Hannah yeah, I, I sort of defer to you here. I think this is a really, I mean, it's a really super interesting question. And I felt like your work helped to kind of clarify a lot of this issue um, for me. But yeah, I here I sort of defer to your expertise, <laughs> big time. Well, I think what's fascinating about your work in this context, Hannah, is that, you know, to the degree that moral argumentation or just general but persuasive attempts could frame the value that we attach to the effort, like that may very well feedback loop back, loop back into and shape people's decisions and how they value the effort involved. So, from I mean, from my perspective, it's questions about who, like if, if it's more empathically challenging or effortful to empathize with an antagon an antagonistic political opponent, for example, then it may very well matter if my the groups that I belong to argue that we should or should not do that, and how that and it, it's both an interesting philosophical question. But I think it also becomes an empirical one when we see how value then gets encoded and predicts different outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is really interesting work actually looking a bit at that. It's sort of group values effects on willingness and ability to empathize. In Especially I'm thinking about sort of politically polarized situations, but you might imagine how it could, at least in principle or in theory, sort of generalize to other cases. I think that's fascinating and helpful. So I'm mindful of the time as well. We're a few minutes over. Um, I don't know if either of you or if Martina, if you have any questions um, for, um, for our speakers, but are there any last questions you have, the two speakers you have for each other? Um, I guess that it was just, yeah, really great to hear about Hannah's work in more detail. And it would be great to maybe continue these conversations offline because I'd love to hear more and thinking about how we can define these different aspects of common ground, I think is really interesting so that we can think of the best ways to increase them and whether that is just simply kind of intergroup contact but how how we can expand that to like bigger groups of people I think that's a really interesting avenue likewise I super appreciated Patricia's presentation it was fascinating and it was so great to have the opportunity to hear more about um, the work that you're doing and I'd love to continue some of these conversations offline really appreciate it yeah, well, certainly, um, yeah, there's both the great talks, fascinating areas that overlap. I think this is this particular area of like effort and how we think about it. And especially when we add the social, layering on the social groups we belong to is such, is just rich for collaborations and for further conversations. Um, so yeah, well, thank you both for taking time to join us. Um, I also want to make sure to thank the Department of Psychology, the Department of Philosophy, both for co-funding this alongside the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, if you are interested, so two and two last points of uh, order, I guess. So um, please do, we'll send out a little survey for attendees. If you attended, please try to fill this out. We'd love your feedback on the talk um, on the panel. And then if you want to, the next one is next week. We have um, Oral Feldman Hall and Victor Kumar talking about moral and social learning. So if you found this, this conversation fascinating as I did, please make sure to join us next time as well. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Hannah and Martina as well. Really, really enjoyed the talks. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. So you go, Hannah. No, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you everyone for your questions as well. It was really nice to get so many questions in the chat and be able to have a conversation even though I couldn't see you. But hopefully we can in the future. Feel free to email me. Yes, likewise. Thank you all so much for coming. All right, thanks everyone.